entered this five-week series about IAC. The vision, how do we get to that vision? Alan Sega did a great job last week on the vision of IAC. Our main goal is to bring glory to God, but the vision is to becoming a community of disciples, making disciples of the nations for what? The glory of God. And so those two first ones work together. I has explained it like becoming a community of disciples plus Making disciples of the nations equals bringing glory to God. That's our vision here. That's what we want to see happen. But how do we get there? And he, he briefly introduced the four M's. The, the, the meat, let's know Christ. Mature, let's grow in Christ. Mobilize, let's serve Christ. And then multiplication, that's what we want to see happen. Expansion of our Father's kingdom. Share Christ. And so I, I get the privilege today uh, to talk about the meat, the meat, right? And when we think of meat, I'm not talking about the meat in your fridge, like chicken or tibs or quanta, even though I like that. Actually, quanta wouldn't be in your fridge, right? It's hanging in the shed out back. But hey, that's some good meat. I like that kind of meat, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the meat that will change your life now and forever. See, our, our meat here at IC, it is, it's twofold. Today I'm going to spend a majority of the time on the first part because the second part really flows into that next M, mature. And I'll explain more of that later, okay? So don't leave early, don't dip out, or you're going to miss a precious little nugget right there at the end. So we have all types of meetings, right, in our lives. We do. Some of these meetings, they benefit us greatly, and some actually just kind of bore us, maybe. Uh, we meet new friends. That's fun. We meet new co-workers, that can be a little nervous, right? New at the job. Uh, we meet new girlfriends or boyfriends. Flutters in the heart, Ooh, right? That happens. The young people know what I'm talking about here. Us old folks were like, we did that a long time ago. Um, and then we also, uh, we meet spouses. And for me, it was like meeting a beautiful angel of light. And I'll explain a little bit more, a little bit more about that later. Uh, and then we also have board meetings. Boring. Bored, right? Now, of course, I'm not talking about the elders' meetings here at IEC. Please, those are some of the most exciting moments of my life. Really. Oh, I might have just lied in church, so forgive me, Lord. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Brothers, you know that those meetings are exhilarating, right? But my point is we, we have all types of meetings in our life. And imagine what it would be like to meet face-to-face -face a king or a prince or a queen, Queen Elizabeth, a cup of tea with Queen Elizabeth. Imagine what that would be like, right? Or to the, to the, to the prime minister's house, Dr. Abbey, yeah. to share some buna. Even better. Buna's better than tea, come on. This is Ethiopia. And so there was a time, a few years back, back in Charlotte, North Carolina, when I was back fundraising, and I got to meet my childhood hero. Now, I was driving past this park, and there was just so many people out there, and I'm like, What's going on down there? I'm, trying, I'm checking it out. So I park and I get down and I start walking down the hill. And I go, oh my gosh, best mile. OMG, like there he is. And I start getting giddy. If you don't know what giddy means, it's kind of shaky, kind of woo, just nervous inside. And I'm still like 50 meters away from this guy. And then the event closed down. And then the moment comes, I find myself two or three meters away from him. And I'm literally about to vomit. And then this happens. Yes! You know what this is? That's just me and Mike. Now, some people know you as uh, your, your Aaroness, MJ, Michael Jordan. I just know him as Mike. That's me and Mike, you know? Just, that's me and Mike. Look, Woo. Just hanging out the basketball court. That's what we do. But look, when I was taking this picture, my hands were so shaky. And I had it on the square thing. So I'm like, there's all these squares, and I'm freaking out, and I can't even get the... And his guard's like, Mr. Jordan, we have to go. And he's like, hold on, hold on. And he looks at me, he goes, Jordan, if you know his voice, he's like relax. And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And then I get on there and I, boom, I'm surprised this picture is not blurry, right? Because my hands were shaking so much. 
But the point being is we do have meetings throughout our life that, that don't change us much. And, and there are definitely some meetings that alter our way of life. I mean, for me, I got back in the car. I was like, cool, I got a picture with MJ and I kept living my life. And I'm sure for him, he was radically changed. He has to have this picture on his wall in his house because he was changed by this event in his life, this meeting. I'm sure of it. Uh, I like to have fun. You know that, guys. Life's so serious. We need to have a little fun sometimes. Um, but what happens? Let's actually get serious. What happens when we meet the creator of the universe? What happens when we meet the creator of the one, the one who, who, who creates the things we can see and the things we cannot see? What happens when we meet the one who wove you together in your mother's womb and knows the exact number of hairs on your head? Or in my case, my body. I'm a pretty hairy guy, so it's amazing he knows all those hairs. So what happens when we meet him? What happens when we meet the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Jehovah Jireh, the One who provides, the Jehovah Rapha, the One who heals, the Alpha, the Omega, the Savior, the Messiah, the Great I Am. What happens? What happens when we meet him. Mm. Well, before we go to the place where we should always look for strength, correction, wisdom, and so much more, the Word of God, please let us pray. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, the great I am, you are holy, holy, holy. And we just want to meet you over and over again. We want to stay with you and we want to meet you and we want to commune with you and we invite you here, Lord. We need you, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here to meet in this place, to meet us in our hearts, to meet us in our seats, to speak through me, remove me and speak, O Heavenly Father, and prepare our hearts, Holy Spirit, for what you have today. In Jesus' name we pray. By Jesus Christos, Son. Amen. So we're going to look at three people who met Jesus and see what happened. Now, in the first service, once I did this, I was like, man, that was maybe a little long, three people. But I was like, man, there's so many people who, who met Christ and were changed. And I was like, we can't just do one. You know, we can't just do one person. And we were, I was having breakfast with my daughter the other morning, and she was trying to guess the people who I might talk about today, right? And so she was saying, maybe it was the guy who climbed in the tree just so he could see him or get close to him. I said, no, nope, but that, that would be a good one. She said, okay, it's got to be Lazarus. I mean, the guy was dead. And he brought him back to life. I said, nope, but that would have been a good one. Mary Magdalene, nope, but that would have been a good one. And then she says, what about the prostitute? It has to be the prostitute. I mean, he stood up for her, defended her. Man, nope, but that would have been a good one. She says, okay, the apostles. has to be some of the apostles or, hey, they were out fishing and they didn't catch anything. And he's like, cast their net to the other side. Then they had all these fish. He like changed their life. I was like, well, nope, but that would have been a good one. The point is, there's so many stories throughout the New Testament where, where their lives were completely changed by meeting Jesus. And that's why it's so important we want people to meet Jesus. And so the first person we're going to look at today is the lady at the well. Out of John chapter 4, verses 1 through 30. The text is going to be up here. There's going to be a good bit of text today. And sometimes when we see text up there, we're like, oh, i got to look at all that text. Man, it's the Word of God. It's way more powerful than anything that's coming out of my mouth right now. So as we read the Word of God and when it's up there, we should get excited that God is speaking to us through these words. So may you be encouraged as you see and read the text, and may it speak into your hearts today. So here we go. We're going to read John chapter 4, 1-30, through 30, where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though, through, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them. His disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sakar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because the disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to. 
you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How could you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Well, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Oh, I don't have a husband, the woman said. Jesus said, you're right. You, you don't have a husband. You have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the one, man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet, so please tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? While we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gizerim, where our ancestors worshipped. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman. The time is coming will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him this way. The, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then the disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? Side note. I love that part. Like, who in the world is going to question Jesus, right? Like, not me. I'm not questioning. Maybe Peter, but he's the only one. All right? And so, <clears throat> the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came, streaming from the village to see him. Skip over to 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village, so he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. So what happens? Let's look at what happens to this lady at the well, and I believe it's what should happen to us. The first point is when Jesus, he meets us where we're at, no matter who we are. He meets us where we're at, no matter who we are. You see, this area the Jews would not have been excited to stop in. I mean, they would have gone all the way around just to avoid the Samaria area because they despised them. See, the Samaritans were this racially kind of mixed of Jews and Gentiles, and even the, the Jews and the Gentiles didn't like them together, but the Jews really didn't like them. They saw them as an un- clean people group, right? They did not like him. And most Jews would not have interacted with all, I mean at all, because they would have thought it would have made them unclean. They would have been dirty then. But Jesus, we find him not only interacting with her, right? He's not only interacting with her, but he's asking her for water, not worried about being made unclean at all. He's meeting her right where she's at. And again, she's surprised, I'm sure, because she's a woman, the disciples came back, they were surprised that he's even talking to a woman because in that time, a man would not sit there and talk so casually with a woman. And so we see that, that Jesus meets her right where she's at, and that's what he does in our life. He will meet you right there where you are, no matter who you are, or where you've come from, or what type of sin you may live in in that, be living in now. Jesus meets you where you're at, no matter who you are or where you're from. The second point is that he satisfies the void that we are trying to fill with the physical. See, Christ knows we have this void inside of us, this emptiness in our souls that longs to be filled. And through life, we try to satisfy this void with many different things. We try to satisfy it with relationships, with careers, with drugs, with position, with busyness. Menamen, menamen, menamen. So many things we try to fill this void with, but Christ is the only thing. We're trying to drink this water that leaves us thirsty. 
And Christ is saying, look, I have the water you're looking for. You just have to meet with me. All right, just have to sit down with me. So Christ is the only one that can satisfy. And he sits there at the wells of your life. The well of your life. He just sits there waiting to meet you and give you that living water. <clears throat> the third point is that he does, and we don't like this part, he does call the junk, he does call out the junk in your life. He calls us out. Now, Jesus knows exactly what this woman's biggest struggle is. He knows it. And he could have just immediately said, now, you know, Jesus wouldn't act like this, but he could have said, hey, look, woman, you're sexually immoral. Everyone in town knows that you've had many husbands, and even the man that you're with now, the man that you're with now, you're living in sin with, you need to make some major changes in your life, right? But that could have been overwhelming. Well, put her off a little bit, and... Truth be told, us Christians can be a little overwhelming sometimes when it comes to sin. We can push people off because we just come at them so aggressively. But Jesus doesn't do that here. But at the same time, he doesn't say to himself like, well, you know, she's got some sin issues going on, you know. And, you know, I don't want to offend her and go through that whole awkward conversation of kind of mentioning her sin. So, you know, maybe I'll just ignore it. No. He doesn't take that stance either. That would not be loving to allow someone to stay right there in their, in their sin. Jesus knows the importance of revealing the sin to the sinner in a loving way, a caring way. He gently lets this woman realize what's going on with herself. He tells her to bring her husband, right, to the well. And she sees an opportunity to admit what's going on in her own life. <clears throat> And so he reveals the kind of the gross parts of her immorality, but what's cool is it's not enough to make him bail on her. He doesn't leave her. He stays there with her. He talks with her. Just because she's leaving in sin, he doesn't be like, I'm not going to talk to that girl. She's, she smokes cigarettes, and she does this, and she does that. Uh-uh, she's a sinner. No. He sits there, and he stays with her, and he communes with her. And when we truly meet Jesus, he'll do the same with us. Sometimes we don't want our sin pointed out, Right? We don't want our sin pointed out. And sometimes even our sin can keep us from meeting Jesus. But we should always remember, please people remember, Jesus is kind, He is patient, He is loving, and He doesn't point out our sin without also being there to help us overcome that sin. He didn't bail on her because she had all this sin in her life. He stayed there with her. And He does the same with us when we meet with Jesus. The next one. He reveals, verse 26, he reveals the truth about himself. He reveals the truth about himself. Jesus is the one who opens our minds and our hearts to receive who he really is. Brother Phil did a great job at Easter. I thought he did a great job. One of the parts he talked about was there at the end, and he's, he's saying then Jesus opened the mind of the disciples, right? Jesus opened the mind, and that's what he does. He opens our mind to the truth of the Scriptures and the truth of who he is. She had asked the question about where to worship, right? In a physical sense. Physical sense. But Jesus re reveal, His response reveals that God can be worshipped. He can be met anywhere. Not in the mountain, not in Jerusalem, not just in this church, but in your car, at your workplace, at your universities, your schools. Jesus can be met, met anywhere. And that's the truth about Him. God can be worshipped anywhere. And then in 25, you see her faith in Christ. And, and, and He affirms that faith that I am. I am the Messiah. He reveals the truth about Himself. The last point with her, we get excited to tell others. And He uses us to expand His kingdom. We see her there at the end, rushing out to tell everyone, He told me everything about Myself. She, he, he knew everything. And then everybody's listening and they start to believe He's using this woman, that, this woman you never thought that would be used, the Samaritan, right? Who was deemed unclean to go and share what he had done for her. And then many came, invited him. Here's another amazing point, that he went to stay in that village for two days with unclean people. And then many believed, right? So he, we get excited to tell others, and then he uses us to expand his kingdom. It's beautiful. Beautiful. All right, and then the next person we want to look at is one of my favorites because he reminds me a lot of myself when I was growing up, and I'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, but it's out of Mark chapter 5. 
Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And it's the demon-possessed man. <clears throat> so we're going to read about this demon-possessed man and see what it was like for him to meet Jesus. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of Geshem. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. This man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the, sh the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him and ran to meet him and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and surrounding the countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. Praise God. And they were all afraid. Then those who had been with, seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed at what he told them. What's the first thing we see happens here with the demon-possessed man? And something we should, we should do, we should recognize Jesus' authority, power, and position when we meet Jesus. We see that even from far off, the demon-possessed man runs, runs to just meet Jesus and bows before him, seeing that authority that he has in respect of who he is. And even the demons know the truth about Jesus. They know that he's the Son of God. He says, you, Son of the Most High God, they, they recognize his position. That he has the power, the power to either torture them or to spare them. And they beg him. The demons recognize this, that he has this power, that he's the king of creation. They know this. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one? You do well. But the demons even believe this. And they shudder. They, they tremble with fear. See, the demons believe this. But what's the difference between the demons' belief and the faith that is required for eternal salvation? The difference between the demons' belief and faith and saving faith is the question of lordship. We recognize the authority and the power when we meet Jesus, but the lordship, who's the boss of my life? Who's the boss of your life? To whom have I entrusted my life, my future? Who has the final say in my lifestyle decisions? See, demons have already made their choice. They're going to follow Satan. They didn't say, save us, or, you know, we'll follow you. They said, just don't torture us. Please, just send us over in those pigs. They've made their choice. They're going to follow Satan. The kind of faith that saves us is the kind that changes us. It changes us. And we see that happen in this man's life right here. He's changed. The man was cast off. That's the second point on him. He's radically changed. He was cast off. He was marginalized by the community. He was so crazy and strong that no one could control him. He's roaming around this cemetery, and I assume naked, because they say when they saw him, he was fully clothed, and he was sane. But have you ever felt like he probably felt? He felt deemed unfixable. Have you ever felt unfixable? 
unworthy. Huh? No one gets me. No one understands me. Well, look, when you meet Jesus, Jesus does. Jesus completely gets you. He completely understands you. After meeting Jesus, not only was this man changed, but the people of the community recognized the change. They, they, they're like, oh my gosh, there's this guy who was howling and cutting himself and roaming around the cemetery. Now he's sitting there clothed, completely sane. The community, the people recognize the change. And let me tell you something. If you think you've met Christ and the people around you can't recognize it, you may not have met Christ. Really met Him. Really got to know Him. Really surrendered to Him. But when you do, the people see it. And He puts us in our right mind. And then the last point on this guy, once again, we see what? He sends us on mission. He sends us on mission. You see, this man wanted to stay with Jesus, right? Jesus, please, just let me get in the boat. Just let me go with you. You changed my life. And this is how it seems we feel, and we do sometimes, right? We just want to meet Jesus, say the prayer, and then just cuddle up with Jesus on Sundays. And cuddle up with Jesus maybe in a little small group, right? And we just want to hang out with Jesus. But no, that's not what Jesus does. Jesus wants us to go out and tell the world what He's done for you. He says, look, just go. Just, it's simple. You don't need a theology degree. You don't need to go and learn all about this. Just go tell people what Jesus has done for you. Tell Him with the mercy that He's shown you. Tell your family. And then He goes down and tells the ten towns of the region and He sends Him on mission. And He wants us, believers in here, if you're a believer and a follower of Christ in here, He wants you to be on mission for His glory and for His kingdom. And the last person we're going to look at in the text is out of Mark, five chapters later in verse, um, chapter 10. This guy we don't want to be like. All right, We don't want to be like this guy. In chapter 10, verse 17 through 27, is the rich man. So I'm going to read this text. As Jesus was starting out on His way to Jerusalem, let me stop right there. In these three stories, what have we seen Jesus doing? He's going. He's out. He's not in a building. He's not in a structure. He's mobile. One of our M's. Mobilize. He's out to mobile and multiplying and meeting people. We just see him in all three of these. He's out in the community, and that's what he wants to do with us also. That's an extra bonus point. So, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came out running to him. Once again, running. And knelt down, recognizing power and position. And asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all the, these commands since I was a, a young kid. I've done this. I, I've, I've read my Bible. I've prayed. I've, I've gone to Sunday school. I've led some small groups. Ta-da! I did it. And Jesus is like, okay, good. It says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. I don't know if it was love or pity. If it was me, I'd feel pity for him. But it's love for him. And he says, look, there's still one thing that you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. Rajim feet. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who is in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Look, we look at this man's life, Jesus, the first thing we see is he tells us what we already know. We already know these things that we're supposed to do. He says, look, I did these things. I did these things. And Jesus, before that, he says, look, the commandments you already know. He's like, I know them. Jesus tells us what we, we already know. I mean, a lot of times I get this question like, I don't, I don't know. I want to do more for God, but I don't know what to do. Or, you know, I hear this question like, I know he has a calling on my life. But how can I do more for God? 
You get those kind of questions. And then most of the time we get responses like, well, if you want to do that, uh, you should read your Bible more, you should pray more, you should have more quiet time, you should give 10% of your money, have a small group, you know, do these things. And those are great things. I'm not down on them. I, 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 part of all of that. But Jesus is, 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 Jesus is calling us to more. As you see in the last point, what we see happen, He calls us to more. He wants us to surrender all. He wants us to surrender everything. That's the key verse right there. Yes, we've done all these check, 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 check. But Jesus is saying, but I'm calling you to more. Now, it doesn't mean you have to sell your house and all your possessions and give to the poor, but it does mean that Jesus is always stretching us when we meet Him. Jesus is always wanting us to do more for the kingdom and surrender it all. There's so many stories, so many stories throughout the Bible where people met Jesus and were radically changed. Radically changed. I mean, not a 360 degree change because that would kind of be going the same direction, right? I mean, it's a, it's a 180 degree change. Change because they met Jesus. Because they met Jesus. And that's what happened. I mean, people, they did. They cut holes in ceilings to get dropped down to him. They did climb in trees, as I talked about before. They dismissed shame and rejection as they pushed their way through the crowd just to touch the hem of his robe. Not to meet Jesus, just to meet his robe. That's how powerful the authority, the radical life-changing power that Jesus has. And that's why we want people to meet Jesus. And so we've heard three stories from the text today. And, you know, for those of us who are believers, we believe this is the Word of God and it's powerful and it's truthful. And there are also seekers, people who haven't completely believed that truth. And so I want to share another story with you real quick of someone's life that was radically changed by meeting Christ. And that's my story. A real life story where when I was in my childhood, I was full of anger and full of rage. I was involved in toxic relationships, drug use, dropped out of school in the 11th grade. I was like this man in the cemetery. No one could control me. I'd go to court. I'd get put in jail. The chains, the shackles, whatever. I, I didn't literally break them, but I didn't care about them. I just kept moving about in this life in a destructive pattern which, as I said, got me in and out of court and in jail. And then in March 12th, 1999, there was a meeting that took place that did change my life. That's where I met the most beautiful angel of light that I was talking about before. Where two weeks after being out from a 60-day stint in the county jail, I met my wife, Carmen. Now we met, at a, but at the time, we met in a club. So she wasn't much of an angel. And the type of club we met in was, was a rave. It opened at midnight, closed at 6 in the morning, and then you go to another party around 7 in the morning, and that's the kind of lifestyle that we were living. We were, we were self-medicating our pain throughout life. Her pain, her suffering, she was self-medicating. Her brief testimony is she grew up in a severely abusive home, an abusive home where she ended up becoming a young uh, teenage runaway, in and out of group homes, counseling, mental hospitals, self-medicating her pain, but as we call it, trying to fill that void that is inside of all of us, that we all try to fill it with something. But we met, and we fell in love, and it, it did. It's, it's a meeting that changed my life, because I know that, that God, even in the darkness, and this is, a, this is a truth, even in the darkness, God is still functioning. The light is more powerful than the darkness. And in that meeting, God was colliding Two lives together for His glory and for His kingdom. And we know that today. So God is good. It's a meeting that changed my life. And, and we fell in love and we were just partying in that environment though. And then we did, she, her kind of church understanding was when she was 15, her mom took her to church and was like, please fix this kid. She's making me crazy. Kind of that type of thing. And she goes and she goes up and she says the prayer. She gets baptized. But she says, but my life got worse for the next 10 years. And it's like my brother Alan Sega said last week, what was missing was that community aspect. Bringing her into that community and maturing her and bringing her up. And she got worse for the next 10 years. Well, she was still going to that same church out of check, 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 checklist, you know, when we met. And that's where God began to speak to me in different ways. I don't have time for that whole story. But I began to beg this God that I was beginning to know and understand to intervene, to change our life. We're moving towards marriage. And, and if we continue in this destructive path, 
our lives are going to fall apart. We're going to get divorced or we're going to cheat on each other. And so in God's great plan, He answered that prayer. A month after being married, I got arrested and set up, well, set up and arrested for trafficking drugs. I was looking at seven years in prison. And so that was our honeymoon year. Your first year of marriage is hard enough, right? I'm looking at seven years in prison. So I went to that same church, and I did the same thing. I walked up front. I I said the prayer. I got baptized. They put me in Sunday school with that community aspect that's so important that Alan Say was talking about. I wasn't really brought in and matured up. And so months afterwards, as we're waiting on court, we're back out of church and we're using again still trying to self-medicate and fill this void because it wasn't a complete surrender. It wasn't this true meeting. It was just an understanding. But then court came. Sentencing day. My lawyer came out and said, the best I can get you is three years. And I said, man, we're young. We're newly married. Three years. She's not going to be there when I get out. I love this woman. And so I get before the judge, the physical judge we were talking about before, but then I just go to the judge. And I just start begging for mercy. God, please, I know it's my mistakes, it's my life, I've messed up, and he knows it all, as we've seen in the text, and he knew it all about me. And I said, please just show me mercy in this moment. And he did. I ended up getting 15 to 18 months in the state penitentiary. So I was sentenced, that was mercy for me. I turned around and I told my wife and my family goodbye, and I went behind the door and they put me in this little cell, this little holding cell. And who would have thought, who would have thought that the king of kings The Lord of Lords would have met me right there in that jail cell. What a meeting that was, I'm telling you. The the things that I tried to fill my life, the void that I tried to fill my life with, that just, I always say, I I was filling the emptiness with emptiness. And what's that equal? Emptiness. I stayed empty. But in that moment, in that jail cell, just getting locked away from my wife, and I'm upset and I'm sad, it wasn't a magic prayer. It was a surrender. I surrendered my life to Christ. I said, it's not my life anymore. It's your life through me. And in that moment, the peace of God that rushed over me, the content, I mean, just all the things I tried to fill my life, that void, Christ filled with me in that moment in that jail cell. And that's what happens when we meet Jesus. And I was in jail and I was just growing like crazy. I mean, I was just meeting him and meeting him and staying with him and communing with him. And I was growing in the Lord. And I I said this in the first service, we don't like coordinate the songs or anything. I love the first two songs. Because those first two songs, this church that picked me up for the last nine months of my sentence, that picked me up and brought me in the community. They didn't see the green pants and the white shirt, the prison attire. They saw a man. They believed in me. They matured me. They brought me up. And those two songs, we would sing there. Especially, the, oh man, the Elijah song. It, it brought me back to that place where, where we met together. And they encouraged me. And I matured. And then I got out and praised God through His faithfulness My beautiful wife was standing there at that gate. And it was hard through prison, trust me, trials and trials and tribulations. But when we meet Christ, He's for us. He's not against us. And He's faithful. And He got us through that time. And He brought my wife to Him and us together. And then what's He do? Just like we saw in the text, real life. He sends us out on mission. And that's what He wants to do. It started with just leading youth groups and the little missions locally. And then he started, it's his, make your mark through our front porch, off our front porch in Charlotte, North Carolina, working with prostitutes and crack addicts and working with youth in the inner city to today living in Ethiopia, getting the privilege to work with these kids with purpose, these kids that are living out in the streets and getting to be a part of God bringing them to new life. He sends us out on mission. This is real life. This, I believe this word to be powerful and living, but my life is a testimony to the goodness of God And when we meet Jesus, it changes everything. When we meet Jesus, it changes everything. And that's why we as Christians, speaking to the Christians right now, the believers, should get so excited. We should be like bursting with energy right now to rush out that door and meet. Meet with people so that they can meet Christ through you. You see, Jesus isn't sitting around the corner in a burning bush anymore. He can. He will. He'll use the rocks if we won't. (laughs) But he's also just not out there leading people through a, you know, during the day, through a cloud, through a night, a pillar of fire. He's wanting to meet people through you, my brothers and sisters. He's wanting to sit down in coffee shops and at your workplace, and he wants to meet people through you on mission. So where's Christ want to meet? On the mission field between your two feet. 
That's where it's at. The mission field's right between your two feet, and that's where Christ wants to meet other people and use you. And we focused the majority of today's meet on meeting Jesus. That's what we focused on. And I trust that Jesus has met with many people in this room just speaking into your hearts. And we're going to give a chance for that, you know, that speaking, whatever He was speaking, give an opportunity for you to act on that here in a little bit. But as I mentioned before, the second half of our meet, it just naturally flows into that next M, which is the mature, which will be talked about next week. And, and for us to mature as Christians, we have to meet together. And, you know, um, and we have to meet together so that we can fulfill Hebrews uh, 10, 23-24. So let me read this text. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Um, truthfully, I almost it was getting long in the first service and I was praying through this last part of... You know, should we keep this here? And it is, it's in this part because it was getting long. But it is important that we meet together. It's so important that we meet together because so many special things happen. We see that we're up here on here, we're motivate, to motivate one another to acts of love and good works and also to encourage each other. And just a little story, what just happened is I was thinking about leaving this out and then I went over to Bacon Brew, which is a great place, um, and I just had a little coffee in between time. And I'm sitting there and I'm drinking my coffee and I asked for the bill. He saw it, please. And he, he goes, oh, it's okay. She paid for it. I said, what? I meant to know. And this girl comes up and she says, look, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you. I was, at the first, I was in the service and, you know, the Spirit was moving and really spoken to me in different ways. And I was like, man, praise God. So she was motivated or encouraged or touched. I was then encouraged encouraged by, by her, her gift and her blessing. And it made me realize we shouldn't, we don't leave this part out. We don't neglect this part of meeting together because what happens when we do this right here? What happens? The Spirit of the Lord moves. The Spirit of the Lord speaks into our hearts and He encourages us and He motivates us. And that's why we should never neglect this meeting together. Because I trust that today, as the stories were shared from the people in the Bible and the different things that happen when we meet Christ, I trust that as I shared my story about meeting Christ and as we've met together, that the Holy Spirit has been moving. And that's why it's so important that we meet each other, that we're encouraged, that we're motivated. And I trust that the Spirit has moved in your heart today. And everything that you heard of today. And what do people think? Who cares? It's about meeting the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He meets you right there in that seat. It's not a magic prayer. It's a surrender. And if you do that, we'd love to know because we need to meet with you and help you and grow and mature together.